Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. I am so excited. One of my favorite authors is here. It's Larry Watson. He's the author of Montana 1948, but he's here with his new novel, As Good As Gone. Welcome to Anderson's in Naperville. It's so great to have you here. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And the book is only out in the world one week. One week. And one one week. week and one day. One week and one day. That's right. So, so you know, of all your readers and, and the people who love your writing and your novels, what are you hearing so far ab about As Good As Gone? I'm hearing good read. And and that yeah. makes me very happy. Yeah. Good read. And yeah. that's that's and that's the best thing you can say sometimes. Absolutely. Because yeah. then you know you're going to recommend it to everybody. Yeah. Um, so I saw it has an indie next pick for this month, which is so great. Didn't it get it got an indie next? My wife tells me it's July. It's July. It's not okay. June. It's July. Yeah. It's in the July. Yes, yeah. yeah. so it was in the July. And you got two starred reviews, so that's way cool. It was but, wonderful. Yeah. 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 Um, so this is your 10th novel? This is my 10th novel. That's what That's I thought. Right. I counted yeah. right. I counted right. Yeah. So, so how does it feel each time one comes out and you're putting your, literally your babies now out in the That's world? That's right, yeah. Is it feeling any different than, you know, since Montana 1948 came out or, or now? It's, you know, it's uh, it 2016? feels a little different. I mean, I've done this a few times, so... Sure. It's I, not your first rodeo, so you can say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I know... Well, I'm not going to say I know what to expect because I know n not to expect <laughs> anything. Right. Uh, but sure, it's it's familiar to me. But I've also been doing it long enough now that I notice the way some things have changed. Yeah. My first yeah. novel came out in 1980. Yeah, and so and you know, and that's what I, I ask so many authors that things have changed so much. Just just the way we communicate and everything, but also the way an author communicates with readers. Absolutely. Even yeah. the way publishers relate to yes, readers. Yes. It's changed so much. Yeah. And, you know, of course, you didn't have a website back in 1980. What was a website? No. What was a website? <laughs> no. What was the Internet? No, you know? That's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and back then, uh, students didn't send me emails asking for help with their papers. <laughs> I'm sure it, your life as a professor has changed very yeah. much, too. Um, so tell us about the seeds of where this book began to grow. And I, I think this character, Calvin, what an incredible character. This is, this is a person that will stay with readers, I think, for a good long time. I'm getting a lot of different reactions about Calvin Seide. Yeah, Some have really right. surprised me. Yeah. Uh, Calvin Seide, I think he might have started a little bit when I was a kid and looking at watching Western movies. Okay. And, um, but when I watched those cowboy movies, I was aware of some kind of tension between myth and reality, even as a kid, because these were idealized portraits, and Hopalong Cassidy didn't look anything like my grandfather, and my grandfather was a cowboy okay. in uh, eastern Montana, and uh, my grandfather was nothing like Calvin Society. In fact, he's sort of the anti-Calvin <laughs> okay. Society. Uh, but uh, early on, I think I was aware of this myth and reality duality with, with the West and Western mm -hmm. heroes, and so it might have started way back when. Yeah, and I think sort of, and I don't want to give too much away about the book because sure. that some of these things could be spoilers. What happens in the book, but you know, with Calvin, it, it's sort of how he feels who he is and this code that he has and these things that he feels. But it's also other people's idea and that myth of what they think a cowboy is. Even his grandson in the book. Oh, absolutely, you know? yes, yeah. yes. And he tries to educate his grandson. He says right. uh, a cowboy isn't something. A cowboy does something. Right. And he says that uh, I've probably dug more holes for fence posts and I have uh, roped cattle or something like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, but it's interesting that you mentioned that about him looking at the world and others looking at him because one of the one of the ways that I struggled with this novel in an early draft um, I didn't have Calvin Seide as a point of view character. I had others looking at him but I didn't have his perspective on the world right. and once I got that the novel sort of fell into yeah, place. Right. So Montana, small town Montana, I know sure. you have a family history of, of that. And so tell us a little bit about that. And you did mention your grandfather. Yes. And you grew up in Bismarck, I did. Uh, North Dakota. Yeah. So what, what, what does small town Montana, because you set so many things in, in the mountain states and in this part of uh, the United States, what does it mean to you? And, and what, what does it give you that fodder for these stories? Well, it started with Montana in 1948, and, and when I 
located my story in my little fictional community of Bent Rock, Montana, mm -hmm. I really got in touch with something, um, uh, sort of discovered a vein, and um, it opened up possibilities of character. Uh, of course, that novel and others have had sheriffs in them. My father was a sheriff. My grandfather yeah. was a sheriff. I was able to use some things from my past, my heritage, my region, and even language. I think yeah. something happened with language with that, with that book, and it's continued to happen since then. Yeah, and that's that's something I'm always so blown away by your writing is the prose you use, but it's dark and it's, but it's so real. You oh, know? thank you. I mean, thank you. and that's one of those things that I. And, and that's why your books, when I read them, I've heard other people say the same thing. These are not books you skim through or you read, you slow read them. Because there are things you go back and reread. Because there are some, some really, and such simple dialogue or simple words that are said, so much is said, which I, I find, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> I'm not sure how I do it either. <laughs> uh, I write very slowly, and, yeah. and uh, I don't often put a sentence down that I don't revise a few times. Um, I look words up in the dictionary constantly. And uh, I am trying to say as much as I can with as few words as possible. Yeah. You know, so Calvin Seide, you know, he, he's such an interesting guy. I mean, the, his background, you know, here he's a, now that he's abandoned his business as he was a mm -hmm. real estate developer and his son has taken over, but you know, his wife tragically killed in a car accident. You know, he basically fell in love with her when he was fighting in France during Correct. World War One. Yeah. He was yeah. a he was a GI, and um, so basically he goes into basically he's a recluse. He just he, is. Yeah. he basically sort of shuts himself away from his family. He abandons them, and he um, basically decides, of course. The bottle, and then and then wants to basically just take odd jobs and and go back to being a cowboy. That's right. Yeah, whiskey, odd jobs, and uh, translating Latin poetry. Yeah, and that was that was the that was the most interesting aspect. And you like that? That's good. I That's love so good. that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, and I, reading the classics in Latin. I mean, this was such yeah. a, such an interesting guy, and I'm thinking of some of that poetry he must be reading because he carries that volume. You yeah. know. But it's so interesting. Is he? Are any of those aspects? But you know, you talked about your grandfather. But any other parts of his DNA come from other people that you've known? Not really. Oh, well, I did take Latin in high school and college, so I <laughs> finally got to make use of it. Right. Um, no, but you mentioned something about him being reclusive, and and he's when he goes off after his wife dies to live by himself in that trailer on the prairie. That is the second time, really, that he's that he's left um, Gladstone. He, you know, he was somebody who was notable in the community, mm -hmm. a, a sort of dashing romantic figure, and um, he turned his back on that and went off to have the cowboy life. And then, when he brought his wife back, uh, he settled down in the community once again and and took up the family business. So he has left uh, on on other occasions. And I think of him as somebody uh, who has difficulty fitting in civilization. He's not even sure he wants to. And, right. and um, so, and, I, and I, I connect that with a theme of Western movies, Western books, Western television programs. They're often about building a community or sustaining a community. And so I thought I could use Calvin Seide as somebody who sort of worked around the edges of that theme. Right. But it's also, you know, you think of those stereotypical, you think of that, that lone cowboy riding off that's into right. the sunset. You yeah. Know, it's, yeah. It's that type they, of thing. they ride in, they solve problems, and then they ride back right. out again. Yeah. Or in this case, sometimes not solving the problem. Exactly. Because yeah. of, the, of the way they think they should be solved, but yes. they're not really solving right. anything. Um, so most of your novels, besides you know, we talk about Montana mm -hmm. and, and some of the mountain states, but it's it's all set in that same mid part of the last century. And yeah, I'm sort of stuck there. No, well, I got no. up to 1963 <laughs> with this one. But, yeah. 1963. Well, yeah. lots happening in the 60s, and it's a very different time when you think for Calvin, and being you know as he's been you know living on his own and and doing his own thing, but now he's his his son, who he abandoned, is now calling for his help because his wife needs surgery and they have to go into Missoula, which is a number of hours away. And he's asked him to come and watch his two children, his grandchildren, yes. and a as, teenage girl and an 11-year-old boy. That's right. And as one reviewer said, <laughs> he's probably the last person you want watching your children. I know. So uh, you, but but he, yeah. takes the, he, he 
yeah. uh, accepts the yeah. the task and and tries to do a good job of it. And if he doesn't always, it's not because he's not well intentioned. Right. right. Uh, but the nineteen the the sort of mid twentieth mm -hmm. century is an era for me that. Uh, works particularly well because it's often characterized as an era of, of repression. You know, we talk about the 1950s as buttoned down and right. buttoned up and stuff. But uh, uh, so I always sort of wonder if, if things are being repressed, doesn't that mean that something's going to be popping up over here? And uh, I find that very useful for fiction, very right. useful. And I would imagine putting a teenage girl and 11 year old boy at this time you're really going to see the stark contrast, especially for Calvin and his relationship with his two grandchildren, because things have changed tremendously even since his own children were at that age. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and 1963, it's the pre-Kennedy assassination, 1963. Okay. Um, so it's still a little bit of the 1950s, but the 60s are definitely on their way, and change is going to be so rapid that... that uh, Calvin Seide's head's going to spin. That's right. And, and this, this story takes over a short period of time. It doesn't I go, think it's about a week. Yeah. yeah. But, you, but you do have flashbacks of the past. Yes, yeah. And I love those flashbacks to give you. you such insight into stuff. Um, so, um, you know, like I said, you won't forget Calvin in all of this. And, um, but I, I wondered, retreating, you know, it's, it's interesting when he moves in with any starts taking care of the two grandchildren mm -hmm. and he moves into this house he doesn't stay in his son's bedroom he goes into the bas the basement yeah yeah and that was another way just to shut himself away or to not be a part of but be a loner yeah and, exactly and exactly right and yeah. he's coming back to his to the house that once was his, his. but he doesn't yeah. want to make too yeah. large a claim on it uh, through a few drafts, my working title for the book was Cowboy in the Basement. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> How interesting. Yeah. How interesting. Um, and I love the part that he was reading Latin. And it's funny, I looked up one of that catalyst. Um, there was a quote, and I thought this was perfect for him. Oh, this age, how tasteless and ill-bred it is. Yeah, oh, so I've cool. forgotten that. Oh, that's very good. But it's kind of kind of speaks to Calvin a little bit. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. <laughs> So Calvin's son Bill, you know, I, yeah. I wondered so much about him and his dad and his relationship with his father, having been pretty much ignored and abandoned by him when he was still pretty young. And um, so, what, tell us a little about that relationship. Well, yeah. I think of it, I think of Bill as one of those men, one of those people, who, uh, in adult life, still wants and needs something from a parent. Uh, yeah. It doesn't happen to everyone. I mean, some people can turn their backs on their children, and some children can turn their backs on a parent. Uh, but Bill still wants and needs something from his father. I don't think he knows exactly what it is, mm -hmm. affection, mm -hmm. um, recognition. Uh, but he also wants to do something for his father. He'd like to bring his father back into the the family right. and, and the human community. So yeah. that's why he's asked for the favor. Right. And I, there's a quote early on by him, it's hard to imagine a man who values independence more than Calvin Seide. Yeah. And yeah. that's how Bill sees his dad. Um, so Anne, you know, mm -hmm. in, in this, there's, there's some conflicts because I think, well, just like in real life, Everyone has conflicts sure. in life, whether you're going through something or you're in conflict with something. It's the engine that drives fiction, you bet. Isn't it? <laughs> yes. and, and it's so true to real life, true. But, you know, Anne, here she is a teenager. She has an ex-boyfriend who's stalking her pretty much. And and Bill, Will, who's only 11, is getting bullied. Yes, he is. And, and so tell us, tell us a little bit about, you know, when you talk about the 1960s and 1963, you know, some of these issues... They're timeless. I mean, you hear about so much about this stuff that's going on in 2016. Sure, you and use the term stalking, and in 1963, no one said stalking, right. but that didn't mean that people weren't doing it. Right, uh, right. And, and also, I think in, at that time, that children had difficulty talking to adults about some things. So both Anne and Will have problems that were they able to speak freely or openly uh, about yeah. those problems, I'm not saying that they would go away, but they wouldn't um, be as troublesome as they turn out to right, be. Right, right, right. And I love Beverly Lodge. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, I, I did really too. I loved really loved her. I liked her a lot. And I, she loves Calvin. She did, yeah. 
and the, and the interesting, you know, here she is, a, she's a former teacher, but what an interesting relationship that I don't think he notices or in some ways it, when they first start to get together. So, no, so he doesn't. He no. doesn't notice. No. And it, that was, that made me sad. Yeah, that. yeah. yeah. Um, oh. You know, he's, he's willing to enter into a certain kind of relationship, yeah. but yeah. he doesn't see in her what she sees in him and feels about him. Right. And um, yeah, I, I I agree. It is sad. Yeah, he doesn't see himself reflected in her. No, that's right. Which yeah, is yeah. yeah. She and finds something both in herself and in yeah, him through that yeah, relationship. Yeah. Is she based on anyone? She's not. Okay. No. Um, you know, I, I really an awful lot of, of many of my female characters uh, have a little bit of my wife, and so that's probably true of Beverly. Okay. It's probably true of Anne. Okay. I okay. liked Anne a lot too. I thought she was uh, very brave. Yes, yeah. yes, very brave. Um, so I think when you know when Will asked his grandpa, you know, teach me how to be a cowboy, yeah. um, and his response, but he really, I think his response is so interesting, saying you know, but it, you know, a lot of people make a mistake about what a cowboy is, but in a way, he's making a mistake, you know. I, it's I, it's a chance. It yeah. was a, a chance, an opening right. for him to say or do something with his grandson, and he yeah. sort of dismisses. He dismisses him, it you know. and doesn't see it what, for what it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's the whole book is in talking about Calvin and his view of himself, but also people's view of him and his his time that sort of has come and gone, and and things have changed. But it's sort of that myth versus the reality, you know. And and I think. All of us who grew up watching westerns, and even even some westerns that are being made today, or, or movies that archetype of what the cowboy is, is so interesting in reading a, a character like this who has now has been through so much and is, has such interesting characteristics that's so different than that typical yeah. cowboy, but yet still sees himself and has this code of ethics, but when he tries to apply them. It just doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. And and yeah. it's not as though we would say that those are the wrong values or something right, like that. Right. It's just that in Kelvin society, they all go just a little bit too far. So yeah. th you quoted that line about independence. Well, he is so independent that he can't even live with, with other yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, I think he would think that he's somewhat chivalrous and mm -hmm. it comes out, however, as sexism. Right, um, right. He's so self-reliant that he won't let anyone get close or, or let anyone help him. But it's sort of like his rules are his rules, and Absolutely, he doesn't need yes. to follow anyone else's. That's right. And, yeah. and sort of turn it into a little bit of a vigilante a little bit. We won't give any spoilers away no, about anything. But yes, yeah. yes. He has that, that um, well, I was going to say a Western distrust of authority, but I think it's an right. American trait. Yeah. And you're right. In, in Calvin Society, that distrust turns into... I better handle this myself. Right. So, so some of this, you know, having come from a dad who was a sheriff, and you mm -hmm. said your grandfather was a sheriff yes. too. Um, did you put some of that in there? I mean, sort of as the, as the anti with with you know what Calvin is compared to what law enforcement says how the way things should be done. Uh, yeah. Probably, probably. Yeah. I mean, once I, I I happened upon sheriffs as as characters for my fiction, I knew that that they were really useful for working out. Uh, questions and issues of, of morality. Yeah. Um, there's a brief conversation in the novel when Beverly asks uh, Calvin about uh, talking to the sheriff and, and once again Calvin is dismissive. He knows who this person is and he doesn't think that he'll be able to handle it. Right. He can handle it but the sheriff wouldn't be yeah. able to handle it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting how he tries to handle things, and yeah. it's just, it becomes a disaster. You know, my, my husband loves your writing. And, oh, thank you. And he, he likes to compare you with a little bit um, to Larry McMurtry. <laughs> oh, that's high praise indeed. No, and yeah. he, he just, so he wanted me to tell you that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you like it when you're compared to other writers? And, well, I think with somebody like McMurtry, that would be a huge compliment. Sure but, it is, yeah. But, but, um, but, he, but he, he sort of considers you as a more, well, the 20th century compared to doing the, the 19th century. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those types of things. But he absolutely loves your writing. Sure. It's flattering. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Being a professor, and you, you taught at the University of Wisconsin at, at Stevens Point and, right. and also at Marquette, 
literature. Still teaching, yes. Yep, literature and writing. Um, how has those experiences, has it helped you as a writer, or informed your writing in any way? I'm not sure. Um, in, uh, well, I, I, uh, I write with my students. I give them little prompts at the beginning of the class mm -hmm. and have them write for five to 15 minutes, and I do those too. And I'm sure I've happened upon some material during those exercises. Uh, I think it probably helps me in revising when I start listening to my own lessons and, ah, and looking okay, at my prose. Sure. Yeah. Do you ever let them read anything that you're working on, your students? No. Okay. No. Uh, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. they're free to read anything sure. that I've published, but oh, sure. no, I don't impose yeah. my drafts on, on <laughs> them. And what, what do you think is that biggest piece of advice you give them for those who, who want to be a creative writer? Or be oh, it's not complicated. Read and write. Read and write. Yeah. Um, if you do both, you'll become a better writer. That's for sure. That's yeah. for sure. And that's what I think um, any writer who says they don't read, I don't know how that's possible. I don't either. So Milkweed, you've published yes, the mm -hmm. other, and now this is Algonquin. Yep. So how, how has that publishing experience been for you changing It's been publishers? wonderful. It's yeah. been wonderful. Uh, you know, so many people have come up to me and have said, oh, you're so lucky to be with Algonquin. Yeah. And it's not that I doubted that, but I wasn't quite sure what they meant, and I know now. I yeah. know now. Yeah, they no. are uh, so supportive. They watch over every step in the process, and they're sort of there with you all the time. Yeah, it's been wonderful. So your editor, a different editor than you had before at Milkweed? or um... Sure. I had two different editors at Milkweed. I was there sort of in two different eras, mm -hmm. so I had two different eras, uh, right. two different editors. Right. Uh, and a new one now with at Algonquin. Yeah. I've gone through a lot of editors in yeah. my, in my but, but writing both, life. Yeah, but both presses they they they're smaller, and they I think they so care about what they what they've put I, out I there. agree. Yes, it's and just, they care uh, about uh, books being well made and and staying in print. Yes. Right, yeah. and keeping their list smaller so yeah. that what they do publish is it's really special. Yeah. So I um, I read that maybe um, I know you've optioned or options were bought for Montana 1948 mm -hmm. and and this book to me was so visual I could so see this so, I mean the, uh, people and the have characterization been casting it already. oh I, I know and I so I <laughs> have, is there anything in the works that could happen with any of your novels being because uh, you know Montana 1948 came close a few times yeah. and and there's a production company. Um, who, and they own the rights, and um, they've come close, and another yeah. writer producer came close, but so far nothing's happening. Yeah. So say as good as gone. Sure. Who who, who would you cast as Calvin? Have you thought about well, it? Well, I, I are you trying not to do that? I, I've always had difficulty sort of playing that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, casting the movie because I see the characters in sure. a particular way, yeah. and it's hard to put Clint Eastwood's face there. But many people yeah. have suggested have said Clint, Clint Eastwood. Eastwood. Sam Elliott, Robert yeah. Duvall. Yeah, uh, I've, right. I've heard all of those yeah. in, in right. reviews. But I, I like to keep my own image in okay. my head. Yeah. I think, well, we always say the, the book is better, right? <laughs> Than Often, the movie. Yeah. Often, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so this book is, is full of such, I guess, the loss and the abandonment and the grief, but also it's that, that book of um, that family connectedness mm -hmm. is, yes. and also the loyalty that we have no matter what happens within our family. But you know, there's a lot of sadness in this, but then there's, to me, there was a lot of love and sympathy and I felt you could really feel for Calvin even though you didn't agree with the way he did things or the way he said things or the way he reacted or treated people, but you could so feel that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and those, what do you hope that readers will take away when they read As Good As Gone? Oh, my, I, I don't have high hopes. I hope they, they are entertained. I hope it makes them think and feel, and if those things happen, I'm happy. Okay. Yeah, and I think they will be. So, so Larry, what are you working on now? Anything, or you can't um, tell us, or do you like not to talk about those? Yeah, things? I'm always I'm superstitious. I'm afraid of saying too much because okay. I'm going to say it out loud and and say and that he's after a big white whale and it's going to sound stupid and then I'm going to abandon the project <laughs> or something. Uh, I have a few things that I've been working on and I'm yeah. in those early stages trying to sort of tell, see if I can figure out which is the one. Yeah, right. I don't know yet. Okay. Oh, one question I did forget to ask you. 
do you, do you, when you sit down, and I don't know what you teach your students too, mm -hmm. but sit down to outline, or is it basically just a very sketch, you know, a beginning and end, and then you fill in everything else as it, as it plays out in your head? Uh, yeah. It's not even an end. I mean, I don't know the ending when I, ah. I begin, uh, yeah. and I don't do outlines. I have some things figured out as far sure. as yeah. characters and yeah. setting. Um, and then I have an opening sentence and a situation, and I'm making it up from. Oh, see, I yeah. think I think that's so cool because basically, what's happening, what's moving you, what's making you react, is the same as when we're reading it. So that's. that's, that's it it is. That's right. And I hope to yeah. be making discoveries as I write. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I love that. Okay. I end these interviews with a little quiz. Okay. You know all the answers. Okay. They're all about books okay. <laughs> or authors or whatever. Okay. So it's Harry kind of... Potter, I hope. <laughs> You can throw Harry Potter in there if you want to. No, I can't. <laughs> okay. All right. What was your favorite book when you were a child? Might have been a Zane Gray novel, um, but it wasn't one of his Western novels. It was one of his novels set in a colonial America, and I oh, can't wow. remember the title. Yeah. Okay. 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 How about a book in, say, high school or college that you that still has stayed with you? Something that really. Oh, that's easy. Um, uh, Catcher in the Rye. Okay. Catcher in the Rye. That was a very important and influential book. Yeah. And what about a book you've been an evangelist for that you could not tell enough people they had to read? James Salter's Light Years. Oh. I love that book. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What about a fictional world that in any book that if you could live there, what which book would that be in that world? Wow. A fictional world. Well, I'm teaching Hemingway in the fall, and so I've been rereading Hemingway, and I wouldn't mind visiting that 1920s Paris of the sun also oh, rises. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, and what book do you recommend to your students if you want to give them something to read that will make them, give them some? Well, I, I do make book recommendations, but I try to make the recommendations fit the student and what the student seems to be interested in and right. the direction the student seems to be going in. Uh, there's some wonderful um, uh, Fiction writing texts out there. Janet Burroway's writing fiction, I think, yeah. is is probably the best. Okay, okay. Have you ever faked reading a book? Have I ever faked reading a book? Uh, you wouldn't admit that to your students, but <laughs> no, that's right. And now you're going to make a record of it, and <laughs> I'm going to say, uh, I'm I'm sure I have. I'll I'll, I'll admit that I have not read uh, Moby Dick. So, that's okay. A lot. Okay. I get that answer a lot, yeah. so that's but, okay. Um, <laughs> You know, I got through high school and college, and so sure, okay. I must have faked, <laughs> faked it someplace. Okay. Along. Okay. How about a favorite novel of the West? Is there any one that's written something about? A river runs through it. Oh. Yeah. I, that's just a beautiful book. It is. Um, and anything you shared with your kids or your grandkids that you love to curl up and read together? We really loved uh, a couple of of Randall Jarrell's books with Marie oh. Sendak's illustrations. Um, uh, Animal Family, I think, was one. Oh, that, those were great. We those liked, were yeah. great. And what are you reading now? And it, or anything you've read recently you really enjoyed? Well, I, I read uh, Jane Smiley's uh, 100 Years trilogy, and I loved those books. Yeah, I really thought they great. were wonderful, and I was yeah. just so impressed with that achievement. And they were fun. They yeah, were fun they to are read. fun. Yeah. yeah, she usually does make her stuff fun. Yeah. Okay, 100 percent, A plus. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Well, Larry, thank you so much, and congratulations on As Good As Gone. Thank you very much. Great questions. Great conversation with Larry Walson. He's one of those authors that you read slowly because the writing is so wonderful. He's been here with his new novel. It's called As Good As Gone. You've got to read it. Thanks for joining me on Authors Review.